Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M, one one as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator for startups. We have the mission of helping a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mission, we do a lot of work in the media. We do these roundtables, free mentoring roundtables, week after week after week. This is our 395th session. It's been going on since the fall of 2008. So long, long, long journey. And uh, we've had over 70,000 people uh, participate at this point. So it's been an incredible view into what's happening in all corners of the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis entrepreneurship, what are entrepreneurs doing, what kind of ideas are being uh, worked on, and so forth. The event is being recorded. You'll find this recording as well as all recordings on our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtables. Um, if you are live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. And join us on Twitter at at 1M by 1M and, and or at Romana. And we publish a lot of interesting content through both those um, channels. Now, this is a roundtable. We want you to participate. The structure today is going to be two pitches first, followed by a guest. Um, so we are going to do Mahima Kapoor and Syed Shutari and their pitches first. Um, make a note of the numbers. I will put the numbers up when we are ready for call-in and conversations. But definitely line up your questions, because uh, we want you to participate. And it, well, it needs to be a participation uh, roundtable, not just a broadcast. Um, so let me set a bit of expectations on the pitch portion, the entrepreneur pitch portion. This is a working session. Um, so we, every session we work on a certain number of um, entrepreneur pitches and projects. Um, in doing that, one thing we want you to keep in mind is you should feel completely safe. This is a safe place where we are going to candidly discuss your questions, issues, roadblocks, etc. cetera. Um, and, but remember, we are on your side. We have no other agenda besides helping you become successful. So um, it's, you, know, you don't need to feel defensive or anything. You can candidly discuss what is it that you're working with, what is the problem. Now, if you disagree with my feedback, that's OK, too. It's your venture. You're going to be deciding on what your strategy is going to be. One thing that we do need you to remember, though, is that not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't guarantee success. So um, that is a fact of the industry. So don't disregard that fact and try to work around that. Um, we're going to start with Mahima Kapoor from Bangalore, India. So Mahima, please unmute your line and tell us what you are doing. Hi, Shramana. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Happy to be on this call and really looking forward to the pitch session. Excellent. Same here. Go on. Great. Could you move to the next slide, please? You want to tell you what we're about and what we're trying to do? So, yeah, I, um, I've i worked in the past with Unilever and Tata Tea based in Bangalore. I have about nine, uh, nine years of working, and the last three years have been at the startup. Uh, I have two boys and love photography. Um, okay. Abhishek Mukherjee, who is my co-founder, is also my husband. He's um, he we met at Unilever, and he's uh, had a number. last one was with Mintra, which is a fashion e-commerce startup based in Bangalore. Um, we're both passionate travelers, and he's traveled to a lot of countries. Next slide, please. So the website is talkingstreet.in, and the the over the mission that we're on is to build Talking Street out as a social discovery platform for traveling foodies, for people who want to discover the best locally recommended food experiences, because mm -hmm. that's information that's not easily available. And um, from our own experience, when we've traveled, the best food experiences we've had are the ones when a local has either taken us around or guided us to the best places that they feel we should be eating at. 
And while, mm-hmm. yes, there are, there are platforms that today do a little bit of this, we still feel that there's a gap that we'd like to fill with Talking Street. So this, these mm-hmm. are guided tours, you're saying? No, it's actually a, a, a platform where we upload the, the best places to eat in the form of outlets that can be, you know, viewed on a map on your phone. So it's uh, it's a bit like Yelp. It's a curated set of uh, eateries that are uploaded on each of the um, on e- for each city. And we started with India. We've covered about 20 cities here. Uh, we've you know gone city by city, made a community of foodies who have helped us with the top uh, food experiences or eateries that they believe are a must do when somebody comes to that city. And then we take those, we actually do a lot of content around them, try to see if we can connect with some of those eateries, get the stories behind them, and upload them as individual eateries, which can then, you know, be filtered um, by users and uh, discovered on the go. Okay. Uh, So the, uh, yeah, sorry, I think if you could just go to the previous slide, please. So, so our, our, uh, you know, we've done a little bit of research in India with our customer base itself and uh, and a lot of other people who follow travel and food. And we find that a lot of people, especially in the Indian context, they actively seek local food experiences when they're traveling. So they, and they want to eat at places that are frequented by locals. So we, uh, the whole idea has been that we actually try to curate everything right from, you know, street food experiences, which are interestingly done in India as well as, uh, say, fine dining experiences. So the entire gamut of food experiences where food is the center. So great food uh, at popular places are the, are the core of the kind of eateries that we try to cover. We also found through a SCIFT report that even internationally, uh, actually perhaps leading, uh, it, it's something that's happening more internationally, people are seeking unique culinary experiences when they're traveling. Mm-hmm. And our idea is to also ensure that we, you know, uh, actually provide insights into local culture through showcasing local food stories. Yeah, the observation is correct, um, I think, um, that people are looking for great culinary experiences of various kinds when they travel. The big billion dollar question is how do you monetize this because content is monetizing terribly right now. Yes, you're right. So we have some ideas and um, yeah, I mean, to quickly uh, come to that piece as well, we've, we've, engaged, uh, we've got a strong community of local foodies, all of it organic, currently largely India-led, uh, 95% is all in, is only India. But people are coming together and we're trying to make bigger communities of people in each of the city. That's something we're trying now, where at least, you know, each of those communities start interacting and there's a lot of crowdsourcing of content that starts happening. Um, so that's the path that we're working on. Um, and in the next slide is where we've spoken of some of the ideas uh, around monetization, but one of our key questions for you is actually that, uh, you know, would love to hear your views. So one of the things we're doing is actually to look at events. We've done a couple of them already, and um, they, they do well. Uh, you know, if you bring together a, a bunch of really interesting eateries or food experiences, in in a in a setup which is like we tried them in condos here and people Mm -hmm. really appreciated it we had sponsors as well for um you know for uh, those events so that while it's not uh, eminently scalable easily it definitely seems like a, a a route to monetization where we actually pick condos across cities and we create a small kit such that these events can, you know, uh, go from city to city if they're done well. And then there's so a can bunch you talk of about, uh, double click down on that and let's say you're doing a condo in Bangalore and you're creating a food fest for them uh, and then you're bringing a bunch of eateries that you have relationships with into that food fest. What are the economics of that? How much um, how much revenue can you generate for yourself for this business through that? Of course, the eateries are getting paid. Uh, people are buying their food. They're doing their thing for their marketing. What what is your revenue model in that scenario? Uh, largely sponsorships, and uh, to some extent, so that's what we tried with some of the events. There are sponsors, you know, brands that are wanting to get onto that bandwagon. 
because uh, the the uh, catchment is unique you have uh, you know mostly all the condos have people who who have good um, ability to pay and are often target audience for a lot of the brands you know whether it's lifestyle brands or sometimes even automobile brands and they are willing to come on to create experiences as part of that event that's mm-hmm. in our experience so so that's the the biggest route uh, in terms of m- money and then and you can know the nomination what are we talking if you do one event for one condo what is how much money do you make for that from that event for yourself so uh in indian currency we'd be saying about uh, you know in inr about 2 to 5 lakhs it uh, and as yeah 2 to 5 lakhs and and you can only do weekend events right so uh, we're trying to pilot now events in corporates which could be weekdays but you're right they largely be either friday or saturday so you can do two events a week two events a week and and you could have parallel teams doing this in different condos in in a particular city with different sets of eateries and so forth so if there is a have you done any modeling of how to scale this and what kind of revenue can you generate doing this um we haven't done very serious modeling to be honest but yeah that's this is what we're trying to to create you know we create a playbook for these events where mm-hmm. uh, you know you say you define the kind of food partners that you can bring on board and hopefully the brand part of it we actually do centrally where we tie the brands in for x number of events in x number of cities so that's a mm-hmm. recurring uh, revenue that starts coming in and then mm-hmm. we, what we've also done is tied up with an event partner who can scale cities as well uh, and if once they get the hang of how these events need to be done that part then that gets taken care of the logistics and the operations goes to the event partner but they're going to take but, uh, they're going to also take a cut of the revenue yeah yeah you're you're right there in fact they'll take a significant cut but the way we're trying to cut the revenue and yeah, if you if you use an event uh, organization company they're going to take a significant portion of the revenue and your margins are going to go to hell um i imagine that for if you if events is your business if your primary monetization model is events then you're going to need to have your own event organization team across different cities that can even do parallel events in for I mean, you can on, you don't have to do only two events per weekend you can do uh you know multiple events during the weekend in different condominium complexes and and so forth so there are ways of parallelizing this and and doing it and you know scaling it so that's what i would like you to do is to kind of create a model of how many parallel events do you want to do per city in a particular weekend and what kind what are the economics of those how how do you and what kind of an organization do you need to scale that because that seems to me is the uh monetization model content and ads is a terrible way to monetize it doesn't monetize it it's really like peanuts so don't waste your time on any of that um i think you know um the real interesting thing here is the is really the offline monetization opportunity got it uh, shamana but is there anything that you could so okay one other thought you know we have we had we haven't detailed that out here but is also to see if we can actually create uh, self guided food tours that people could buy online so you know we've got all the content on the best places to eat at can we string that together into a food tour uh, and maybe also have a tie up with each of those eateries to offer something uh, and people can buy that food tour on the site and we create the back technical back end required for them to have a great experience while they go from eatery to eatery i somehow doubt it however if you do guided tours if somebody could buy a guide guides are viable you know i mean i think you can charge 800000 rupees or even a bit more if it depends on how long the tour is to it's kind of like a combination of walking tour in a particular area along with a lunch or a dinner or so forth the guided tours you can you can sell if you can create a network of guides that is something that you can mark that can be monetized okay interesting but physical guides is a very crowded space already actually uh, i think internationally more so but even in india now 
So we were, we were, and I don't know, we were just wondering if that's something that will, you know, be a quality issue because it's so difficult to ensure that each and every guide is offering the, the exact experience that you stand for. Um, why do you, uh, why don't you just focus on doing the events? Seems like that is, you know, there is a substantial amount of money that brands, you're saying that the brands are willing to pay substantial amounts of money uh, for series of events. See, I mean, if you can do, I don't know, if you're talking about two to five lakhs per event that you can make revenue-wise, then you figure out how to make that a good margin business um, so that you are you have enough margin built into that the way you organize those events, and if you do a hundred events, that's a you know decent amount of money that you can make out of um, you know if you do a hundred events a year or two hundred events a year, though that's a reasonable bootstrap business. It's not a fundable business, but it's a it's a decent bootstrap business that can be generate plenty of cash for you. Got it. Make sense. Yep, makes sense. So, um, yeah, we had some of these questions, which was also the part about how do we actually, we've got a lot of people on our social media communities, but we're struggling to move them on to our own platform. Um, any thoughts around that? You don't even need it, right? Why bother spending a lot of energy and money on, on doing that? If it, this is a, this is not exactly a technology business, you have a content repository people are following content on Facebook and um, in, in, in a sense that when you do an event at a condo, you, or you work with the condo to publicize the event in the condo, you know, like apartment ADA, for instance, has, um, you know, bulletin boards for every single condo, I think, of consequence. So that's the bulletin, that's the channel through which people are going to find out about your event. So, um, based on the path that you are taking, the, the path that you are proposing to take uh, in terms of monetization from an event point of view, my event monetization point of view, I don't see the need for huge uh, investment in, you know, moving a social media app and, and moving people to your own platform and all that. It's irrelevant. Okay, so what I also hear you say is that, you know, it, there's not much uh, that we can really hope to do with the online community, even if it's there, there's no right. clear route to monetization. That is not going to lead to monetization, exactly right. So you have a uh, community of 300,000 people, great, you can publicize your events in those communities. You can, what you can, if it's an engaged community that is participating, you can get them to contribute content. You can also, the most important thing is that you want them to go talk to their condos and, and want to organize events at, like the ones that you're doing in some places at their condos. And, uh, and that's pretty much the way I think you go to market is, uh, uh, it's, it's, but, but that's the only leverage you really have of your social media community of 300,000. This is not exactly a social media business. You want people to, you know, post on their pages and so on and so forth, but they'll be publishing photos from these events on their own, uh, you know, on their own uh, profiles. They're not going to be publishing on your page most likely. Right. And even yeah. the user-generated content, it doesn't really have that much um, great need here. What you're doing is building relationships with a bunch of curated uh, eateries, and you're bringing them onto these foods. Uh, you're basically becoming an event organization company. Yeah, so that's the part that's a bit disconcerting, honestly, if you ask me. You know, that's not what we set out to do. So that's the part that we're trying to see how to make um, peace with because we've got, come a long way on this. But, but yeah, clearly we don't want to be an event organization. Uh, you know, that's not that's not what excites us. So just uh, trying to think. Content about doesn't monetize, Mahima. I cannot. I mean, in good faith, I cannot steer you in a direction that is a dead end. Content does right. not monetize. So. Not I appreciate that uh, reality check. 
That is a total reality check that you have to take into account and you have to do strategy take factoring that into your game plan. Got it. So if there is a way to leverage your community to power or propagate the event business, think about those kinds of hooks and those kinds of angles. You have created this community, you have you know, you have passion around this community. So what is the what, what is the benefit of this community? How do you want to leverage this community? That's a question that you need to think about. Um, but uh, I, I'm afraid it's very, very difficult to make content monetize. Got that. No, it's good to hear it. I think it's important to face uh, reality. Yeah, I think maybe the way to look at it is like you're saying, to see how can we actually get the community to either accelerate or, you know, help us reach new geographies maybe and see if there's, I don't know, we're just thinking, is there a way to actually create a kit that allows anybody in any city to connect with us and then, you know, put an event together? Because we've given them the exact guidelines, the e that they should go to are up, uh, you know, they can select from those and there is a certain set of, um, I don't know, maybe a set of event partners or something that we, we give them which helps them actually create that event uh, in the way we believe a talking street events should happen. Well, you're going to have to uh, be very careful about uh, how you do that because of quality control issues. Yeah, yeah, that's the part that, like, we don't want, you know, we, yeah, we well, don't think want to. Well, think about it. I think I've given you the most important feedback, which is that you really need to think about what business you're building and see how you might be, see how, can you, how you can be creative about bringing the assets that you've created where you have passion around it to, into a business that does monetize. Otherwise, there's no point. Got it. Thanks, Ramana. Really appreciate Very welcome. your welcome. Thanks. Okay, we're going to Saeed Shitari next. Saeed, please unmute your line and tell us what you're doing. It looks like we have a lot of food-related stuff today. I'm getting hungry. I know, and not just food, but uh, there's so much similarity and overlap with, uh, with, with this uh, sort of a day. And uh, um, it's just that our sort of this has a little bit slightly different context, uh, different context. so uh, I would love to get started then. Uh, Go ahead, let's please. So Let's Lunch uh, sets up uh, events between uh, job seekers and companies at companies so that uh, job seekers get to tour the company, meet um, company employees and hiring managers and uh, you know get introduced before they apply for a job. So this is a way okay. to soft introduce uh you know and meet you know say a dozen or a couple of dozen companies in your area and then see which one you relate to which one you know you are more excited about and then uh you uh are much more informed to apply to the company so next slide i would love to so i saw that uh right now the job seeking market is pretty fragmented you know you go on social media you apply for a job or maybe you are on LinkedIn, you're on various job boards, or you ask family and friends. So there are various ways, and, um, you know, cold mailing your application only returns usually 3% of the time, you know, uh, your resume is opened and, uh, you know, you're contacted because the ATS, you know, looks at the keywords. And um, finding a job through a traditional role is hugely in inefficient because, Companies spend a lot of time on sourcing candidates and realizing that you know they are not a culture fit, and uh, this problem more and more you know millennials and passive job seekers you know they don't even apply to most of the jobs so um, you know unless you know they 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 have known the company so um, we see this as a growing trend. So next slide please. Yeah, so our uh, Solution is this to use face-to-face -face networking for mm -hmm. for people to have lunch, and uh, um, the the way it works is uh, you know four to eight job seekers go to the company, 
and uh, meet and you know have a kind of a small um, get together and lunch and and you know get a tour and the uh, company gets to assess four to eight candidates and do an hour of recruiting and uh, uh, a week of recruiting and an hour of lunch and after that um you know if there is mutual interest uh you know candidates and companies can you know go to the interview round this saves companies a lot of uh, time and money uh, right now the companies are paying uh, hundreds of dollars for job boards or um, hired.com which is the world's biggest marketplace for job seekers they charge 15 percent of the salary like fifteen thousand dollars for every hire even recruiters do the same thing and uh, what it's leading to is most of the candidates accept in the first job offer come on their way rather than knowing you know people at the company in a casual way how it is to work there so next slide um, yeah so the job seeker journey is uh, you know based on you know what kind of uh, uh, goals they have what kind of motivations they have for changing the job and what are their habits for for looking for a job and we looked into that and uh, you know realized that uh, you know there is uh, a way to reduce your online activity while searching for a job and make it much more pleasurable and uh, efficient. And uh, through that, uh, you know, we propose uh, a let's launch a solution that, um, that, that, you know, usually removes inefficiencies. And next slide. So, so before you go uh, to the market side side, let's try to understand the experience that you're proposing here. So uh, four to six job seekers are going to set up, you're going to set up for four to six job seekers an interview lunch at a company. So the company is going to give them a tour and, and have arranged for a few people from the company to have lunch with them at their cafeteria. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And um, so what is the total duration of this whole activity? Uh, our lunch, so I was thinking five minutes for the tour of the company, uh, 15 minutes to give an introduction of the company challenges, products, and the job position, like, you know, what is uh, that they're looking to hire. And then uh, next 30 minutes, a uh, casual uh, get-together lunch, so roughly 45 to 60 minutes of, of lunch. And then company tour, yes or no? Yeah, so first five minutes, uh, company tour, so it takes five minutes to walk around. So okay. Five to okay. ten minutes, and then one next. hour thing. So it's a very superficial touch point, basically. It's not really possible to assess anybody in that little, that many people in that little time, right? There's no depth to that encounter. Yeah. So that's where, uh, you know, towards the last slide, I put my challenge in terms of scheduling. Is it one on one? Because uh, with one on one, we lose our competitive advantage. Uh, that you know anyone can set up you know a lunch with with the company, whereas uh, we realized that having um, you know uh, a scheduled event uh, allows you know um, users to also meet other users and uh, and for companies to um, yeah they can't assess everyone thoroughly, but uh, you know they can uh, you know get a sniff of you know, what kind of uh, candidate will be. Uh, you know, somebody, somebody who stands out. Yeah, it, it can be biased towards extroverts because you know they can talk a lot and you know can can you know stand out. But uh, yeah, that's where uh, the hypothesis and observation has some kind of chink and weakness. But I think it's my passion and interest that is um, you know uh, trying to push towards uh, like what would be. Um, uh, well, you're you going to need to validate because something like this will have to be organized through HR, right? HR would have to set up these kinds of things with you. So there is a competitor called uh, Girl Geeks Dinner. I'm sure uh, you're aware of them. However, they don't host lunches. They host like a big 200 people event at the company. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, our difference is, you know, the larger the event, the harder it is to replicate yes. or repeat. No, I, I like the smallness and the intimacy of, of what you're proposing. All I'm saying is that, um, you know, the large event is to give a lot of information in a one-to-many format, and that's a known format that a lot of people use that, and, and that's fine. Uh, what you're proposing is something 
in the middle between a one-on-one -on -one and, and a large event where it's more intimate, more friendly, more curated in terms of, you know, who comes from the job seeker point of view and who comes, who has those lunches from the company side, which means it's going to take coordination. HR will have to get involved in screening candidates that you present to them. HR will need to get involved in screening the people from the company that are going to take these lunch, these people to lunch, et cetera. So there is a, I mean, this is something that you're going to have to validate with corporate HR departments, basically. Yeah, it's true. So we wanted to uh, remove, uh, you know, validation part also for, for the company so that, you know, let's have uh, um, kind of, uh, um, you know, basic validation done so that uh, companies spend more time meeting candidates and less time, you know, having to validate and having to do that. So we wanted to use, uh, uh, you know, company email address and have users go on other lunches like social, uh, like like peer-to-peer -peer lunches and some other, you know, done. It's not perfect, but uh, we want to do as much as possible so that uh, the goal is candidates and companies just show up trusting that lunch to match the right people with the right companies and See, I don't uh, like I don't like the spray and pray nature of your pitch. I the concept that you presented is a very simple concept. Let's figure out how to make that concept successful. For that concept to be successful you're gonna to need to work with HR and, and get get HR to take this on, pay for it, pay for your service and so forth. So when you come to business model, it is not all these like social media marketing, SEO and so forth, how you're going to be doing, getting, maybe the candidate acquisition happens this way, but the customer, the paying customer is corporate HR. So that means that you're going to have to, um, you'll have to get those people to pay for it. I mean, the, is this something that's going on right now? So you're saying let's lunch that. So you have had 100,000 lunches already? So we started off as a peer-to-peer -peer network where we were connecting uh, entrepreneurs to each other, and that's where the monetization was not there. And uh, we wanted to see, you know, how can we turn this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, in networking lunches to be more repeatable and have a bigger pain point and context because these lunches uh, were the only context they had was, okay, you know, entrepreneur and tech industry, you know, commonality, like a, uh, like a business network. But uh, I saw that the repeat rate and uh, was declining. And when I interviewed users, they said, like, you know, why do I go on a lunch with somebody else? So then I interviewed all database, uh, all of our users and realized the top three things they want from a networking app. So number one was job. Number two was business partner. And number three was meeting similar people. So I thought, okay, how can I help job seekers? And I realized that maybe what if I host lunches at companies and, you know, do what Airbnb did to houses. So before Airbnb, nobody would go to each other's house, although it was possible. And I thought all of these companies have beautiful cafeterias and lunch tables and their employees are eating. What if employees get involved and, you know, have uh, lunch with the, with, with the potential candidate and let's lunch remove the risk uh, so that there is a need and reason. Uh, for it, for the candidate to come in, and the company also has a need for for it. So, right. Well, so, so I think your your point is well taken. This the the what you've done so far basically doesn't monetize. How long have you been doing this? I've been doing like five six years. Five six years, and you haven't monetized. Yeah. So uh, I started off uh, with the peer to peer. I never. Uh, you know, near beyond the restaurant uh, promotion things. But uh, what we were doing was chasing, we had a solution, but we didn't know what problem we were solving. So the networking lunches, you know, by itself were vitamin and not a painkiller. And I think now I want to enter the job seeker market, which is well established and big and monetizes. And we just need to uh, tweak our solution to fit into the job market. Uh, Solution with the uh, and you did this on the side. You had a job all this while that, and you were doing this on the side. No, I did it full time. Full time. How did you? I, know, um, I spent all my, I spent all my savings in four hundred one k. I burned everything I had because I just felt oh like you know. I, yeah. Oh my goodness. Oof. Why didn't you come here sooner? 
Oh, that really makes me feel so uncomfortable and so sad, you know. So the way to build this business based on what you're proposing is to go work with large companies that have cafeterias where lunches, where employees eat, which you can find tons of them in the Bay Area, and work with HR so that HR pays for what you're proposing to organize for them. You're going to have to get HR to pay. So, if, so you do a deal with HR that you're going to every week arrange a certain number of lunches and um, and they're going to work with you, create the system around it so that people, you know, they can screen the candidates that you're bringing in, they can screen who's going to meet with those candidates because if you have somebody who's senior, it has to meet with somebody senior. If you have somebody, you know, it depends on if it's a product person, um, then that product person needs to be paired up with somebody who can hire product people. So you, you know, or, or people, a peer group person who works in the product organization. Um, so you cannot really randomly, um, you know, just have anybody from the company meet. That doesn't serve any purpose. So, so you're going to need to work with a bunch of, you know, when you say finding five to ten companies for pilot program, you need to find, exactly, you need to find actually a hundred pilot uh, company HR departments and, and go figure out if they want to do it, figure out exactly what they want in the application, talk to them, create the application, create the process around it, and, and uh, start monetizing ASAP. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, we need to not only, you know, find HR but, uh, and also find, you know, what candidates they want, but also how many, because is it four to eight or is it they want one on one, or is it they want, you know, as you said, like you know, uh, you know, it could be maybe that we, you know, I'm open for maybe you know, it could be one on one companies want like no more than one or two people, you know, and we don't want to do four to eight, so a number of uh, people, and then how do we verify? Because the and one thing we have done is, uh, you know, our goal is not to be event organizer ourselves. It, our goal is to allow companies to create the profile and create events and manage. It should be like a self-managed platform where candidates can apply uh, to the company with, with a cover letter on why they want to come for a lunch, and company can then you know assess them. So it should be uh, ideally you know without you know any of manual work from our side. So yeah, a lot of things need to be tweaked, like number of com uh, you know attendees, and then how do we uh, give access to companies of candidates and you know. It's and what are they willing to pay? What are companies willing to pay to do something like this? So I looked at the similar. So, so I categorized that lunch in two categories: sourcing and branding. So for sourcing, I see uh, that companies uh, pay around five hundred dollars per job. Uh, listing, and uh, then companies pay fifteen thousand dollars for recruiters and uh, marketplaces for every hire. So either companies pay per hire, or companies pay uh, per job between four hundred to fifteen thousand. So I thought like we charge similar price, like four hundred dollars for four lunches per month. I don't know. You're going to have to go check that because sourcing typically tends to be very, very um, targeted. So it really depends on what level of targeting you're providing. Um, of course, hiring, when people get paid for contingency hiring, that's a, they go through the full process. Recruiters go through the full process and actually com help complete the hiring um, before they get paid. So, so you are going to be on the lower end of that, but are you actually sourcing um, very specific positions, and so so you have to work all these things out. But but I I mean you absolutely need to go turn this business into a B two B recruiting um, you know HR business as soon as possible because that's on, that's the only way you're going to monetize. Yeah, okay. and uh, sourcing and uh, branding as well. So in the branding, uh, companies get to showcase their company profile and photos and. Uh, see what it's really like to work at a company. So we want to give that experience on Let's Lunch so that when you see a company, you get a, a experience that feels like I want to go and uh, you know have lunch at this company. So yeah, part of that is branding. So companies also pay around five hundred dollars for for branding to Glassdoor and to the Muse. So uh, a part branding and part sourcing experience uh, that that we have okay. like. A, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Are we, uh, have I answered your question? Is there anything else yes. that you wanted to ask? Uh, how do I find five to ten? Because I'm a product person and it's pretty hard for me to do sales and find, uh, you know, these HR people to, if I send a cold email or LinkedIn, then it's, it's harder to have them, you know, agree to meet me for, for, for a lunch or something. So that's the only way to do it. Either yeah. you have to use your network or you have to you do cold calling and, and uh, reaching outreaching through uh, LinkedIn. If you cannot, if you cannot do that selling of convincing people who are decision makers in HR, it's this is going to be impossible to scale. Yeah, enterprise uh, sales are so different than you know a consumer model we were. So we were more see, B2C, but now like B2B is different. But yeah, that's a different challenge. But yeah, I'll take care of that. So, but uh, yeah. concept wise and. I, I also it. would recommend for you bootstrapping with a paycheck. Um, I think you should go get a job and do this on the side because you have already spent five, six years doing this full time and you've exhausted all your savings and everything. So it's, you know, I think it's, things are getting a bit unsafe for you right now to continue in this mode. So I, I would recommend that you get a job and, and keep developing your concept on the side. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree to that as well. Okay, good. All right. Um, so we are actually going to speak with a special guest today, Paolo Huvara from Oracle. Paolo, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Hi, Samana. All right, fantastic. Paolo, uh, do you see the green video button next to your name? Uh, no, I see a video button. But can you, you see me? You see a video button? Yes. Can you click on the video button so you can? I, I did. Then you should be streaming. Can you say? Um, I can see that my webcam is on. I'm not sure if it's streaming or not. It should. There we go. Perfect. We're all set. Okay. Well, it's it's actually a wonderful uh, experience for us to have Paolo here. Uh, we've been working with Paolo for a long, long time. And let me introduce you to <laughs> this collaboration that One Million by One Million has had with Oracle for now five years. That's saying a lot to have a long, successful collaboration that started with a minuscule project at Oracle, and then today we are uh, doing an enormous amount of work. So Paolo Hubara is Group Vice, Vice President at Oracle Applications Lab, and um, there's a whole team around Paolo that we work with, and uh, we kind of designed, on One Million by One Million designed its entire incubation, incubator in a box platform based on the original experiment that Paolo, Vinay Deshmukh, Susan Hoffman, and Maureen and I, and uh, we, we started doing in 2013. So we just kind of, I think Vinay heard me speak at some MIT event and, uh, and came to me and was like, hey, so I, I, I see what you're doing. Is there something we can do together at Oracle? And then when I went to Paolo and said, oh, I heard Shomana speak. And, and Paolo and I had already known each other when Paolo was running Open Bravo, which is an open source software company. So it was an incredibly interesting, organic um, experience of a group of people coming together and just brainstorming and creating a program. So it's been really delightful. Today we want to share some of what we have learned, what we have done, how we think about um, internal innovation at Oracle. So um, the way we run this program today is um, twice a year we have Oracle One Million by One Million Intrapreneurship Challenges inside Oracle. And this is a program that is open to all of Oracle. And we invite people to apply for uh, scholarships to study with the One Million by One Million program to learn how to take an idea, flesh out an idea, validate an idea, develop the business case for that idea, and then you know, present it to Oracle for consideration as a potential you know, new product idea or a new module within an existing product area and so on and so forth, but with the 
primary objective of developing people and teaching them how to bring a product to market, all the way from idea to business case development. So let me actually turn it over to Paolo to explain to you from his point of view, what he thinks we are doing here and what are the goals and objectives of the Corporate Innovation Program at Oracle. Yes, absolutely. So uh, as Ramana said, this was a, a very interesting story. So I, a bit of background on me, I, I started my career at Oracle and I spent, I think, the first 14 years of my career at Oracle. And then I left and I went and worked for the company that Ramana mentioned, Open Bravo, where I initially was the head of product development and then I became the CEO. And I first met Ramana when she interviewed me as part of that experience. So she, went, she interviewed me as, a, as an entrepreneur for a, in, in a startup. And, and then later on, I kind of I joined back Oracle in, in my current role. And one of the first things that have been told to me was that Vine, who was part of my team, had been in touch with Ramana and was kind of considering a, a, a program. And not knowing Ramana, knowing, knowing her reputation, I was immediately, immediately interested. And the reason why I was immediately interested was because having Having spent a lot of time in my previous experience at Oracle, I knew that Oracle was a very, very strong engineering organization. With a lot of people at Oracle, in particular in product development, I'm, I'm part of the product development organization, particular in product development know how to develop products. But then when you go in and work in a startup and you are in an organization that does not, does not have as many resources as Oracle, you learn that kind of just having a great product is not enough. You really need to learn not the product market fit, you need to learn how to pitch the product, you need to know the addressable market, you need to know all of the things that the one million by one million program um, um, teaches. And, and so I thought it was, and I was very intrigued by the fact that we could give that experience and the exposures to those problematics and to those teams to, to employees in the company so that they could, they really could gain um, not th those set of skills, and they could complement their um, not their traditional strong engineering skills. Now, I'm not saying that Oracle doesn't do uh, not mm, total addressable market analysis, doesn't do competitive analysis, doesn't do customer relation. Of course, Oracle does all that for its established products, but that is done by a minority of, of people and of the broad population of, of, of engineers or product managers within the company really aren't that exposed to, to those activities. And the One Million by One Million program was for me an opportunity to really expose people to, to those activities. And so we really looked at the One Million by One Million program as, a, as an educational um, program, really a way to complement the skills that people naturally acquire within the company with other skills that are not readily available within uh, within within Oracle, and that that is why we have been no, we, we started that. Of course, there is the you know, the one million by one million is uh, is is a very hands-on program. You, you know, you, people attend the classes and then they you know, they work on an idea, they develop an idea, they develop a pitch on, on that idea, and that idea might or might not become. Uh, part of Oracle products and part of Oracle product roadmaps, and we have some cases where it did and, and many cases where it, where it didn't. Um, but, and that, that is another benefit. But the real goal really is the educational, the educational opportunity for, for employees. <laughs> so, um, you know, let's double click down on, on how we have evolved the program a bit, uh, because when we started, the application process involved uh, people presenting their ideas, you know, very you know, seminal ideas, nascent, nebulous ideas, all right, but, but at that point in the application process, we were asking for people to submit ideas. But as we went through the evolution over the years, we have completely morphed the program. In the ap application stage, we do not ask for ideas anymore. What we ask to see is, why you want to learn what, what is being taught here. What, you do have some interest in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, bringing products to market, taking an idea and developing that into a, a product, business case, etc. Why do you want to learn that? Can you actually 
learn this through online learning and, and so on and so forth. So we kind of changed the application process from submitting ideas and evaluating ideas to submitting kind of like a college essay. And that speaks to what Paolo just explained about, um, you know, this being primarily a, a human resource development uh, strategy for Oracle in that a lot of people who apply for the program actually don't really know how to come up with a good idea before going through at least three months of the curriculum where we teach some of the building blocks of methodology of how to come up with a good idea and how to, you know, flesh out a good idea. So, Paolo, if you want to comment on that, I think it's a very important aspect of how we have evolved the program. Yeah, absolutely. As I said, now we evolved the program that way, really making it more of a of a of a college. So it's just you now we we want to assess the motivation of the person, their their ability to learn, their their willingness to learn, and the willingness to 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 be coached. Uh, a lot of people kind of come to the program perhaps with with different expectations, and and we want to make sure that the expectations are are, are very clear. Now there are other programs at Oracle that are uh, no hackathons, shipping events, and and things like that that are more. Hey, I have an idea, and I no, I develop it, right? I I, no, I start development on building a prototype on that idea. So we really didn't want to you know the one million by one million program to be. You know, it, it is complementary. It's not competitive with those ideas, but it's very different. Uh, it, it really is is about making sure that people understand what it takes to take to take a product to market successfully beyond developing a prototype or beyond developing uh, not developing the product technically. Uh, again, as I said, I think there are a lot of people at Oracle know how to develop a product, but you know, the, the rest yeah. of the software skills that, that we have, you know, that, that are taught through the 1 million by 1 million program are perhaps a bit more difficult to find or difficult to learn. And, um, and so we really wanted to, to make sure that people had a very clear in their mind that this is what the program is about. It's not about not just about prototyping, it is about not what you want to learn, what you want to get out of the program. There's a lot of work that is required in the program. It's not an easy it's not an easy program for people to go through. Now you need to go through the classes and then you need to do a lot of work to develop your, your idea, the pitch and, and all that. So we also want to make sure that people people understand the level of commitment that we expect of them if they decide to participate in the program. So this, you know, this idea of you know, rather than starting from an idea, starting from from an, from an essay, really thought through that or kind of you know, help people understand that this was a was a different program. Um, now we continue to fine tune the program. Is you know, like like everything else is never is never finished. So every you know, every iteration we we do small changes, small, small tweaks, um, and you know, so far it's been working very well. Yeah, and and uh, a couple of points on on what uh, what you said that we should probably also call out. Like, uh, um, there are over 300, 400 hours worth of material, you know, in the curriculum that people have access to, and we want them to at least, you know, do a good 50, 100 hours worth of core curriculum studying in the first three months that they are in the program, in the Oracle Entrepreneurship Program. And then in that process, we want them to come up with the idea. So the program is split up into quarters. It's a one-year program that's split up into quarters. In the first quarter that you're in the program, we want you to go, go really study the core curriculum and come up with an idea in the second three-month uh, segment you, we want you to flesh out that idea, come up with a, you know, validation, some level of competitive analysis, some level of TAM. By the third quarter in the program, we want you to have a pitch ready, a customer pitch and a, an investor pitch with the assumption that your investor is Oracle in this case. So Oracle management will start seeing your project once you have all of these pieces in place. You need to have, you know, some level of validation, some level of positioning, um, competitive analysis, 
CAM assessment, ROI assessment, et cetera, all of these done in an, and a pitch that is a more sophisticated pitch. And notice one very important choice we've made in designing this program is there's not one line of code writing in this entire process. It is really teaching business skills as opposed to coding skills. We know you can code. You know, vast majority of people doing this program are people who already know how to code. So the real offer here is to teach people how to, you know, it's like a mini MBA of how to bring a product to market following entrepreneurial principles. And that's the learning that we are offering here. So, Paolo, what about engagement? What are your thoughts? Why is the program so popular? Uh, it seems like there, every time we run uh, a, a, an edition of the program, there's a tremendous engagement, tremendous interest, and lots of applications. People are coming to the roundtable. So, all through, leading up to each session's application process, there are six to eight weeks of pre preparation time when we want them, want people from the Oracle organization to come attend the public roundtables of one million by one million, these kinds of roundtables. And, and there is a tremendous number of people who keep coming to these. So what do you think is the, at the heart of that? Well, I think that the program is very unique, right? Is, you know, this, this, as you said, no, this, are, this is a mini MBA. This is you learn business skills. There are not that many other learning opportunities with, uh, within Oracle, or quite frankly, even, even outside of Oracle, to, to learn the skills. And so I think that these are, these are skills that people are very interested in. You know, the, the popularity of entrepreneurship in general, I think, is certainly helps, and people want to have those skills, want to have those, those experience, want to have that, that exposure. Um, I also want to say that uh, your, your reputation also helps, and kind of having, you know, having a a person of your caliber that helps us with this program is, is, is important. I think it's you know, is, is very appealing for people that when they have, you know, they can learn from somebody that is, you know, is, is, a, is an industry recognized leader. You know, that, is, that is an aspect that is very appealing to people. And also I would like to thank, you know, take this opportunity to thank Susan Hoffman and my team that does a fantastic job of pro uh, promoting the, job, the, the program within the company. So uh, I think that Absolutely. These, these three facts Absolutely. Are, I think the, the duo of uh, Susan Hoffman and Maureen Kelly have really made a mac massive impact on the success of this program, no question. Yeah. So um, having a good team executing, if you are in the audience listening to this who, and you're looking at something um, you know, of equivalent caliber in your organization, the execution team is incredibly important. And I've seen a lot of execution teams not succeed in pulling off something that scalable and that high impact just because the execution has not been as good. So, uh, Paolo, let's talk about some of the ideas that are coming out of the program. What are some of the ones that you liked? And, uh, you know, what, what can we draw from, what conclusions do we draw from those? So the so we've been running this program for five years, so there have been a lot of ideas that that came through that. Um, a lot of them have been things that I that I personally like. Um, perhaps you know, if I need to mention a few of them, I will start perhaps with one that was the, from the very very beginning, and it was an idea that came out out of out of my team and was um, strategic network optimization. So strategic network optimization is about using optimization techniques, or if you want, perhaps now artificial intelligence to, to determine the most optimal location for sparse, sparse warehouses so that you can, you know, you can minimize the, the number of warehouses and, and your overall inventory for, for spares without sacrificing the, the service level agreements with your customers. So you look at where your customers are, what is their past history of ordering, and you determine where you, not where you place the, the the warehouses. So that was a really, really good idea that we actually deployed internally um, to optimize the warehouses for the Oracle hardware business. And so we, you know, we, we really gain a lot of a lot of economic benefits out of out of that idea. <clears throat> Another one that was also particularly interesting that I, I remember very well is the the um, corporate social responsibility. So this was came out of an employee in, based in India that started looking at, you know, had the idea of looking 
the Indian government at the time was starting requiring Indian companies to dedicate a, a, a certain amount of their, their revenue to corporate social responsibility initiatives. And so she started with that idea and became you know, a much bigger project than that. It's not that the concept of corporate social responsibility is not limited to India. It's, it is a global it is a global issue. And so many um, many companies were interested in that. And that tied very well with the overall human capital management roadmap of the product. And in fact, we have now inserted that idea in, no, in it's, it became available as, as part of the DHCM product that Oracle, that Oracle offers. Uh, so that I, I would say was a particular success story. <clears throat> um, the last idea that perhaps I would like to mention is one that has that been perhaps more recent and hasn't yet come out of, of an outcome. It is an idea that I personally, I personally really, really like and I'm trying to, to push both within my team as well as outside of my organization. And it is, it is about the not leveraging artificial intelligence for contract setup and generation. So um, Oracle has a set of products um, that are about generating, automa automa automating the generation of contracts uh, or sales contracts in particular. And the configuration of those products is extremely expensive just to not to give uh, just to give an order of magnitude, we just not change from one, or we are actually in the process of changing from one generation of those products into the next generation of those products. And the, I think it was, if I remember correctly, it was like 60 people for 200 days that needed to re-enter the setups for, for this content. So it was a, a huge investment to configure this product. So the products are extremely powerful because once you have them in place, you can, you can generate all of your sales contracts automatically without any touch, so you can accelerate your, your deal velocity, you can uh, dr dramatically reduce your, your back office cost, but no, the initial investment is very high. And the idea there was, hey, we have all this history of contracts that, that ha Oracle has generated, has approved, that are offered to customer, customer has accepted, can we leverage all that history of transactions to generate an artificial intelligence algorithm or machine learning facility that will actually look at that history to determine whether the next set of contracts can be, can be automated? And so essentially eliminating all of the cost of, of setting up those, um, those, uh, those contracts. So that is an idea that was, I think was proposed a few months ago uh, now, given that my group is in the midst of, of this implementation of contracts, I'm actually particularly interested on, on, on that product, but I think it's, uh, it has you know, great ap applicability. I haven't quite been successful yet in finding you know, the right sponsor within the company, but um, I'm working on it and I really like that idea. <clears throat> so this happens quite often that uh, an idea that you know, that actually comes through the project, is, is, uh, through the program, is well fleshed out, well presented, but doesn't always find a, um, an implementation path. But that's okay as far as we are concerned because the learning that people go through in fleshing out and being ready to present and, and so forth is the primary goal of the program. So, so in terms of setting expectations, we try very hard not to set expectations that you know, every project is going to find a path of implementation. There's, there is, an, as a company the size of Oracle, obviously not every project is going to find an implementation path, yeah. but the learning is something that you're going to take away forever. Yes, absolutely. That, 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 is, that is correct. And it is actually a topic that we debate not very, very frequently when we, when we review this program, because at times, generally speaking, I think there are people that go to the program are very satisfied with the learning experience. At times, they get, you know, they get a bit frustrated that you know, their idea, for, although was was well flushed and well well developed, doesn't find that you know, doesn't find that home within within the company. And you now, from my perspective, that is that is perfectly okay. Is you know, Oracle is a very large company, has a huge amount of resources, but does not have enough resources to follow up on every good idea, and so. But there, there has to be, there has to be a selection, and in many cases, the idea that come up are aligned with you know, certain products that we already have in the market. So they could be perhaps new features for those products, but those product development teams 
already have a roadmap that is committed because of customer requirements, because of other things, and so they cannot follow up. They, they need to make a choices, and they need to make choices, and they don't choose. They don't choose the ideas that came out from from the program. Um, I I think that's okay. It's understandable. Is is um, no, people get out of the learn get out of the program the learning, and quite frankly, you know when you when you're an entrepreneur and you're pitching to an investor, you also need to learn to accept the you know, the rejection. I think is this part yeah. of the learning experience as well. Absolutely. Well, and also I think that there is a a, a leadership identification um, that's happening through the program. There are people who are self-identifying that, hey, I'm capable of doing something really intense and, and you know, coming up, fleshing out an idea. I've learned all these skills and, and this is probably a, a very good pool of people that has come together inside Oracle now over the years that are good, can be good product managers, can move from development to becoming product leaders as, as they go along. So there's a career path shift that's happening also uh, absolutely absolutely and that again was my my primary objective when i when i started sponsoring the program within the company <clears throat> yeah. so um let's talk a bit about um tam so total available market size is a is a concept that is of immense interest if you are doing entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship and we have been very very particular about trying to teach through the program everybody, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, everybody, the, in 1 million by 1 million, TAM holds an incredibly important place. We focus on bottom-up TAM methodology. We teach TAM analysis very rigorously and so forth. Why is the level of TAM so interesting? Um, can you mm. comment on, on that, Paolo, from yes, your absolutely. point of view? So, so from my point of view, so let, let's Keep in mind, Oracle is a company that has nearly 40 billion in revenue on, on an annual basis. Uh, now, if you come up with an idea and you eventually want to go and pitch it to an Oracle executive, an Oracle product development executive, and essentially you're, you're asking them to change their roadmap and shift their investment resources from what they're currently investing into your idea. I, you need to make sure that your idea is able to move the needle, is, a, is able to, move, to make a difference for, for Oracle. Not just not being an idea that has the potential to be profitable is not enough. Being an idea that has not good revenue, but revenue in one or two millions or ten millions is probably not good enough to, to make a difference. I think that what we, no, what we, what we are mostly interested in is ideas that really can make a difference and that can generate significant amount of revenue for for uh, for the company. <clears throat> now, those ideas clearly are very rare to come by, and um, no, and so there are, there are also that no, that is that is a challenge. Now, having said all of this, no, although total decimal market is a very very important topic and is a very important topic for people to study to learn learn how to develop and and, and no, execute. Now when we when we look at products within Oracle, in particular when the products are not that large on their own, like I mentioned before, for example, the corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility perhaps is a very large total addressable market on its own. But when you look at corporate social responsibility within the Oracle context, and within that being one of the product offering in the human capital management product line. From an Oracle perspective, that is perhaps more about thought leadership than, than anything else, right? It is um, no, a corporate social responsibility offer within no, that, that Oracle might sell to a company is likely to be sold as an add-on in the context of a larger deal. <clears throat> and so perhaps either no, heavily discounted or maybe just offer at no additional cost to the customer. Um, so perhaps it doesn't generate as much revenue as it would be if it were a, a standalone you know, startup company that put that, put that product to market, but it still helps in you know, positioning Oracle as a top leadership in the industry. And so that is that is another aspect that is extremely oh, value. important for us. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, the venture capital industry is always looking for billion-dollar 
five billion dollar, ten billion dollar ideas. Um, one thing we observe is that if you are doing a product inside of a company like Oracle, it is not necessary to have that level of TAM always to for your product to be interesting or meaningful. So, for example, let's say there is an existing product within human capital management or within warehouse management or logistics or some product line where there is an existing business, Oracle has an existing business, and what you're bringing with through your idea may be a new module that is going to be able to extend the revenue potential and the TAM of that particular um, you know, segment that particular product line by another 200, 300 million dollars. That is still of interest because there is a clear go to market path. And obviously, these kinds of ideas tend to come out of organizations where there's a lot of domain knowledge. So maybe a product, maybe an engineer or a pre sales person has deep domain knowledge, has experienced, you know, situations within their work. Uh, of like, oh, there, here's something, here's a problem I see customers facing. Our current product does not uh, address it, and if we flesh this out and, and see if we can generate another couple of hundred million dollars worth of revenue from build, developing this product or this module adjacent to what we already have, we could we could get another chunk of revenue. That kind of ideas are actually very welcome. Yeah. as part of this program. Yeah, absolutely. And, and perhaps even no, even a step forward, is in, it's not just about generating revenue, but it's, no, as I mentioned, it's perhaps it's top leadership with industrial analysts, yeah. so and, uh, improving the, the, the positioning of an existing product. Or, Help with winning deals. Yeah, or you know, increasing customer satisfaction or increasing customer retention, right? So those are all you know, ideas that contribute to any of those factors are very, very interested in, in, in many ways. <clears throat> so um, one point we should probably highlight is the intellectual property issue. When you are going through the one million by one million program on your own, you own the intellectual property. But of course, this is an Oracle program or whoever, whichever corporate sponsors an intrapreneurship program. I think it's a very reasonable um, conclusion that the intellectual property belongs to Oracle. So everyone who is learning the one million by one million methodology and coming up with an idea through this process, the, the intellectual property belongs to Oracle. Yes, absolutely. So this is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an Oracle sponsored program. It is an activity that employees go through as part of their Oracle employment. And so like any other artifact that they do as part of the, the that they produce as part of the Oracle, their Oracle employment, this is, not intellectual properties owned by Oracle. I think that's that's totally normal, fair. totally acceptable, totally and, and, and totally fair. Um, now, having said that, people also learn no, skills that no, should they decide to move on from the company. We hope that, and actually, part of the program is actually to no, to to help people stay within the company and give them new opportunities. And so that there is also a, a retention value for this in employee retention value for in this program, but. Should people decide to move on, which in some cases is inevitable and is totally normal, they have learned skills that they can apply to okay. their next venture. And if they decide to be entrepreneurs rather than employees in, a, in, a, in an already established company, they, can, they certainly can apply the skills that they learn in, in the program. The, the other point is that um, people are required to do the program outside of their day job as an extracurricular. So the way to think about this here is that, um, you know, a lot of people do uh, executive MBAs or, you know, they do all kinds of training on their own time to advance their careers. So this uh, is structured that it's not like you can do it in lieu of a, of a day job. You have to do your day job and then this is happening on the side and you're going to have to kind of make time you know, nice weekends and so forth to to develop your uh, skills and studying and all of that within this program. So, uh, Paolo, actually, um, there's one point we should probably discuss before concluding this segment is, um, you know, when we started working together on this uh, experiment, the only other really well-known 
corporate innovation slash entrepreneurship experiment with Google's flexible time thing, which was a total failure. <laughs> what, why do you think it failed and what have we done that has be, been successful? What are some, what do you think are some of the, you know, decisions we made that worked? So, um, quite frankly, I'm not in a position to say whether it failed or why it failed, but I can certainly say why it will not be applicable for us or why it will not, not have worked at Oracle and, and what we did differently and why what we did differently is helped, right? Um, as I said, the primary goal here was to allow people to develop skills that they would not normally gain as part of their daily job, right? If we, I think that if we had applied a program, and I, I, I actually did it in, in my initial, my, on a small scale within my group in my previous Previous time at Oracle, I tried to kind of give people a bit of free time to do whatever they wanted, or, and you know it, that doesn't quite work because people. You now, if you give people free time to do whatever they want to do, what they end up doing is what they are already able to do. So they are engineers, and they say, "Oh, I have an idea. Let me start coding on this idea." And that is not what we want them to learn. What we want them to learn are skills that they will not normally that they will not already have and that will not normally gain as part of their, their um, daily work. So for that, we need to give them a bit of guidance or perhaps a structure within, uh, a structure for them to follow. So the, the one million by one million program was perfect in that regard. It really, you know, it has you know, the education component that gives the structure and then it gives, uh, no, it gives people not the hands-on experience of uh, having an idea and developing based on what they learn. So I think it's, no, it, that worked very, very well for us because of, because of that element. Now, just giving people free time to do whatever they want doesn't necessarily allow them to, to learn new things. It, it kind of encourages them to, re, to no, go deeper perhaps in, or try on their own things that they already know how to do, and that, that is not what we wanted. Yeah. The other um, decision I think we made along the way is to constrain what they, what we encourage them to work on, which I think was also an important decision. Um, we would see, when we were asking for ideas early on, we would see B2C ideas a, a lot. And we categorically said we're not going to let you work on B2C ideas. You can work on B2C ideas on your own time, but if you want to be part of the Oracle 1 million by 1 million program, you have to work on a B2B idea because Oracle is a B2B company. Oracle is not in the business of, um, you know, B2C yeah, correct. products. Correct. Um, and, yes, we want Oracle, no, we want ideas that eventually could be applicable to Oracle and therefore a B2B is, is, <clears throat> is a requirement. Uh, now, having said that, we also saw some ideas that perhaps Started as a B2C idea, and then the you know, the participant was morph. able to morph them into into a B2B variant of that idea, and that that was also very interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. So as you can see, um, listeners, we've done a lot of experimentation, and we continue to do a lot of experimentation, and that's been the most fulfilling, deeply fulfilling part of this collaboration is that. We have been very creative, we've been very collaborative, and, um, and the spirit of the program has been absolutely fantastic. So, uh, so I want to, from the One Million by One Million team, really thank Paolo and Susan and everybody else, the judges who've been participating um, in, in judging every uh, session. Uh, it's, it's really been a superb collaboration. It's been great pleasure working with all of you. We've learned, we've all learned. The participants have learned a lot. So uh, thank you for giving us that opportunity and, uh, and making it all a success. Now, thanks to you. The program has been a, a great successful for, and I think it's not that, that delivered tremendous value to Arco. So it's, it's us who, who need to thank you for, for what you allow us to do. Great. All right, folks, we are coming to the end of the session today. We have about 
10 minutes left. I'll give you a quick summary of 1 million by 1 million, how to use the program if you are considering using the program, and then I will take questions. So one request to you from us, if you like what we're doing here, please bring 10 serious entrepreneurs from your friends and family who are trying to learn and get help into the program. And, and earlier in the program, we saw uh, an entrepreneur who spent five, six years doing a lot of things that could have been avoided if in the first year of his journey, he came and joined the program. We could have saved, he's basically spent all his savings and all his 401k and so forth. And I, you know, I just, I was listening to him and I was cringing. I was deeply, deeply moved to hear his story. And it's just, this is the kind of scenario we want you to avoid. Please don't go do stuff. First time entrepreneur's journey is an extremely complex, steep learning curve. The reason we are doing this program is to avoid situations like what we just heard about earlier today. Please, if you have friends and family who are doing stuff like that, refer them to the program so that we can save their savings and their 401k and so forth and, and advise them right so that they don't end up in this kind of a situation. Okay, so in terms of resources, everything is at 1mby1m.com. You will find a terrific blog through which you will learn a lot. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series, we have 12 volumes of case study based books. You can start reading those. That will teach you a lot. Um, these roundtables happen every week. And uh, we have a milestone coming up. Our 400th roundtable is going to be in May, mid-May. Um, the full acceleration program from 1 million by 1 million is the premium program where we offer you extensive methodology guidance, a full curriculum, help with business development, help with strategy consulting through private roundtables similar to these. And we also help you with financing and media relations. Um, the 1 million by 1 million self-assessment is a questionnaire that we would like you to do at your own time. This is a set of questions that any investor will ask you. So go ask yourself these questions based on your project and see where you are running into roadblocks. If you have methodology gaps, like if you, have a, if you see a question that you don't know how to answer because you don't know what that means, what is bottom-up TAM analysis, what is positioning, et cetera. You can go do just pure curriculum at 1M by 1M basic. That's just $99 a month. And you can do, you know, if you can really invest the time to do 1,500 hours of curriculum work in one month, you cannot imagine how much progress you're going to make in just one month. But do it at your own time. You can, you know, there is no uh, hard and fast rule. You can do it at your pace, whatever time you have. By the way, this stuff works very well if you're bootstrapping a company using a paycheck. You can do it on the site nights, weekends, while you keep your job. And that may often be a very good way to start a company is to keep your day job and uh, start developing an idea and learning what you need to learn on the site. So um, go dig in the website. There's a lot of information about what to expect from the basic from program, from the premium program, video, FAQs, FAQs, what's in the curriculum, extensive discussion on the how the curriculum is formulated. It is a case study based curriculum, which I think is one of the secrets of why it works very well. I'm not trying to teach you based on my experience alone. There are over 800 successful entrepreneurs whose case studies, detailed case study of how they put one foot before the other are in this curriculum. And we have synthesized their learnings, their methodology into video lectures and the case studies are also available. So it almost simulates the experience of sitting down and having coffee for an hour or lunch for an hour with somebody who has built something phenomenal. It includes 50 plus unicorn case studies, 400 plus venture funded startup case studies, and then 350 plus bootstrapped case studies. So it's an enormous um, you know, learning based on the experiences of people who have done it before. And you can get to stand on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. The methodology is bootstrap startups, lean capital efficient bootstrap startups. 
Even if you raise money, you're going to have to bootstrap first and raise money later because that's how the market works. The market is not going to find the con fund the concept at this point. They want to see, investors want to see validated ideas. So that's it. Um, the next three roundtables are April 26th, May 3rd, and May 10th, where you do have opportunities to pitch. So go to the URL and uh, register to pitch or attend. And the 400th roundtable is Wednesday, May 16th, where we're going to bring you some, um, you know, case studies actually of people who have gone through 1 million by 1 million, as well as some other case studies from the program. And you'll hear from people who have their own learnings to share with you, and uh, and it's going to be some very interesting presentations that you're going to learn a lot from. Um, in parallel, you know, we have these. Uh, in-person rendezvous happening as well in Menlo Park that started last fall. So pretty much every Wednesday afternoon from 5 to 6, we have um, a, a rendezvous. So look, look on the website and make sure you register. There's one deviation from the Wednesday schedule. Sunday, May 6th, uh, 3 to 4 p.m. is also going to be a rendezvous instead of the May 9th Wednesday one. And there's a specific reason for that um, change in the schedule. So that's it. We have five minutes of Q&A left. So if you would like to call in and ask questions, you can do that. Or you can use the public chat to ask questions, and we will, uh, we will answer whatever questions you have. While you're doing that, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson, Irina at 1mby1m.com. She will answer questions about the 1m1m program. You can get in touch with her anytime you wish to talk with her. And that's pretty much it. Questions, folks? Questions, comments, introductions? If you tell, want to tell us where you're joining from, what you're working on, what issues are you facing, we are very happy to answer those, uh, you know, look at those as well and get to know you. Anybody? No? No questions? Uh, is someone on the call waiting to ask a question? You need to identify yourself, otherwise we don't know. All right, folks, I don't see questions. It's been a, an intense session. I hope you've learned uh, quite a lot from the program, and uh, we will meet back here um, soon, next week, and uh, continue the conversation. And maybe I'll see some of you uh, this evening at the rendezvous. Thank you for coming today, and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.